Thank you. Thank you very much um, um, for, for the introduction. Thank you, uh, Lucy, Demetra, and Mazin uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm glad we made it, and here we are all in the same room. I understand that uh, most of the audience is from the MA in architecture and urban design. No? So, um, welcome uh, to the lecture. I'll, I'll try to share the screen and uh, ask you to please confirm um, you can see the slides okay can you see my slides not yet no okay so let me try again um, can you see it now yes yes, yes? We can see. okay um so uh, again, welcome. I am um, um, very pleased to be here um, um, for, for this lecture. I cannot see you now for some reason, so please um, uh, speak if you need to talk to me um, or uh, write on the chat. I uh, intend to speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes on this question of uh, nature in urban planning and urban design and feel free to interact um, and, and write on the chat um, as we go through and then hopefully at the end we will have a little bit more uh, a little bit of, of, of time for for this for, for conversation for discussion uh, one of the key arguments uh, of this uh, lecture is in fact how um, the very uh, nature of planning is intrinsically connected with the way in which we address uh, the natural world. Um, and this is mediated by or triggered by uh, uh, the question of challenges, you know, how we are um, addressing um, the main um, questions that we have in our, uh, in our times. Um, so I will start with asking you, um, these. No? So what is then nature? So what comes to mind when we hear the word nature? How would you define it? Do you have any uh, courageous volunteers? Uh, when it comes to nature in the built form, we should consider both of the things simultaneously, not only only nature or only built form. So when we try to merge these things together, maybe we can we can come out with a better output. OK, thank you. So you are talking about um, a synergy between nature and us. But then let, let's see again what nature is No, uh, What would we what would be a definition of nature? I asked this question uh, to the Oxford Dictionary to see if it could help me. And, uh, and it says that it's the phenomena of the physical world collectively, including plants, animals, uh, the landscape and other features and products of the earth, uh, as opposed to human creations, no? as opposed to, uh, to us or as opposed to what we, we create. Uh, in that line of thought, um, the individuals and their habitats uh, in the natural world, such as bees, they are natural. And this is us you know, doing our things. And this is where most of us live in cities. And uh, on that definition, uh, we are not you know, uh, natural, not uh, part of the world. We may want to question that. We may have different definitions of it. And in fact, it's this very uh, notion of potentially reconceptualizing our um, relationship uh, with the natural world or our uh, inclusion in the natural world that is um, what is happening, I believe, uh, in, in, these, uh, in these days. Um, planning has for long been marked by um, dichotomies um, and the dichotomy of man and nature or the city and the countryside. Uh, the artificial and the natural, culture and the primitive. So those dichotomies uh, have marked the way in which we 
see uh, in the Western world our relationship with, uh, with the environment around us. Uh, but in fact, if we look at um, the history of planning, one can find uh, a spectrum of relationships. You know, planning has presented a much more nuanced approach uh, to this um, essential dualism. We could look at very technological or, if we want, artificial uh, approaches to city planning um, uh, with a very strong belief in technology. Uh, we can, for example, look at the metropolis as depicted by Fritz Lang in his film from 1927, or what happens in Blade Runner uh, in, the, in both films, um, all the way to the very um, natural <laughs> setting of the primitive hut. Uh, and we have, of course, a range of um, uh, relationships, a range of um, approaches that I would say sit towards the middle of that spectrum and what we one can call balance. Of course, we can discuss what balance may mean um, and we'll kind of touch, touch on that. But what we see is, again, as I said, uh, a complex network of relationships that go from unmediated urbanity to unmediated naturalness. And, and these are important concepts, you know, the idea of urbanity and the idea of naturalness uh, and how uh, one positions oneself in relation to our work as designers. You know? How do we value urbanity? Yet, how do we also think about uh, the question of nature in cities? Do we position ourselves as the more nature, the better, and then see what happens with urbanity? Or do we think that you no know, urbanity is essentially uh, what we should go for and nature is um, a leftover or, uh, or something that um, you know, happens to be uh, with us? Um, and I think this would be highly questionable, of course, but uh, there are different um, approaches along this, this timeline or this, this spectrum that one can position oneself. Um, the question of challenges, as I uh, hinted at the beginning, um, so in, in my line of argument here is uh, one of the key things that mediate uh, or that impact on the ways in which we think about our relationship with the environment. Uh, we can look back at the pre-industrial city, for instance, and see, um, so this is a quintessential representation of an Italian uh, medieval city. So that's the case of Florence, so continental Europe. We see uh, urban nuclei uh, spread onto the countryside, on the landscape, on the forefront, we have Florence. And we see at the background a series of small uh, hamlets and, and villages uh, punctuating uh, the countryside, or if you wish, nature. Um, we here also have um, nature coming inside the city. Uh, we have the river, uh, we have a few orchards around the edges, as you can see on the left hand side of the image. But essentially, we have a relationship which I called, uh, which I call of proximity and differentiation. So we need nature, we are close to it, but at the same time, it's somehow kept at bay. Uh, we are marking a differentiation uh, from that uh, world, a world that uh, we, uh, as I said, we uh, depend on, but also that we fear. Uh, so dangers can come from that unexpected nature beyond the walls. Uh, when we come to the industrial uh, revolution or the industrial society, um, we have a complete transformation of that relationship, which we have just seen. Cities, industrial cities, uh, started to grow uh, substantially. In the case of Manchester, very, very emblematic, you know, had a population of around 12,000 inhabitants in the middle of the 18th century, gets to around 95,000 at the turn to the 19th century, and then in the middle of the 19th century gets to 450,000. You know? So we can see that in a period of 100 years, it goes from 12,000 to 450,000. Um, and cities, which uh, I believe are one of the greatest inventions of mankind in those years, were seen as 
places where one would go and die very early. Now, life expectancy, again, for example, in the case of Manchester, was in the region of 29 years old, which, which was significantly lower than if you lived uh, in the countryside. On the left-hand side, we see an image of Manchester um, with, um, um, a, 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 with a very clear message of how um, technology, how uh, factories were affecting the environment. And I have a quote from Richard Phillips, uh, and that's referring to London. Uh, in London, the smoke of nearly a million uh, of coal fires is found to blight or destroy all vegetation. We knew at the time that we could uh, destroy the environment, and we were doing that uh, with our cities. We did not know yet that we could destroy the whole planet, though, uh, which is something that comes uh, with uh, the nuclear uh, weapons in the Second World War. But at that time, there is this very striking uh, notion that um, cities were destroying the environment, they were destroying the countryside, they were destroying nature. And not only that, they were destroying ourselves. On the right-hand side, we have uh, an image an engraving by a French artist called Gustave Doré, very famous uh, artist uh, and a very famous picture that shows um, this notion of the deterioration uh, of mankind living in such squalid environments. And we have on the right hand side a quote by Henry George uh, in Social Problems saying that the life of great cities is not the natural life of man. Uh, he must, under such conditions, deteriorate physically, mentally, uh, morally. So we have the idea that uh, cities were destroying uh, the environment, but also that cities were uh, destroying ourselves. And that was, to a great extent, a shock, uh, or a philosophical shock, because the Enlightenment had told us that progress, um, reason, uh, the development of the scientific disciplines would lead us to emancipation, would lead us to a better life, would lead us you know, to happiness and to get rid of the things we don't want to do by using machinery. And in fact, what we were seeing uh, was uh, quite the opposite uh, for many people, that they were leading to, uh, uh, to destruction. And the positivism and the philosophy of positivism in the 19th century also reiterated this notion of progress as something necessarily good. Um, here we see that there is a disturbed balance. Even in the previous one, we had this notion of proximity and differentiation. Here we have a disturbed balance in the sense that uh, we have upset the relationship that uh, had been established with the countryside and uh, with nature we, within and around um, the city. So planning appears, or more than town planning, appears in the middle of the 19th century, very much looking at how to uh, save our uh, living environments. Benevolo showed that this happens in two ways. One way would be to, in fact, leave the existing city alone and work around it, uh, such as the case of uh, the plan for Barcelona by Serda from 59. So here we see an expansion uh, plan for Barcelona. Uh, the, the existing town appears here in dark uh, or in black, and we have the expansion plan uh, around it, connecting it to uh, the suburbs and the other villages around. And HIE is very much uh, present in this new vision of cities and the garden city idea uh, as well. So the notion is that, again, the, the big city is not quite the right environment for mankind. We need to go into smaller, medium-sized towns, live in the middle of nature, and the idea of planning uh, from anew, you know, to create uh, uh, towns and cities from scratch. There were also others that were looking, in fact, at how we could transform uh, the existing uh, cities, not only let them alone and then create a new environment, uh, but actually see if we could reform them. Um, in the United States, we had the park system movement championed by Olmsted, uh, also with the help of uh, Calvert Vokes that looked at the idea of park systems, looked at parkways and, and this, well, the notion of uh, central parks and so on, and how uh, the introduction of nature back into cities would be a way of uh, making them livable again. Um, here we see a couple of diagrams by a German uh, engineer called Rudolf Eberstadt, 
who was at the very beginning of, of my research in green regions and here and uh, these are from the transactions of the first international town planning conference organized by the IBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, in 1911. And here he was uh, very critical of the idea of a green belt or the notion of concentric growth. He was saying, well, OK, medieval cities did grow by concentric rings. Now you would create another city wall, create another city wall, accommodate people inside. Uh, we would happen to have a few green spaces here and there spread within the urban fabric. And if we put a green belt around, um, in a way we create a, a kind of straight jacket that prevents the city to grow. And uh, we also keep most of the green spaces away from actually where people live. So the urban, the inner urban areas where the green spaces must be, now, that's where they like the most. And if we put a green belt, well, we are not really addressing uh, people's need for open space, for fresh air, for sunlight. Instead, he said, well, cities um, are not growing concentrically anymore. They are growing radially um, along the lines of public transport movement. You know? So we have the bus line, tram lines connecting to the suburbs, ribbon development, and these radial growth of cities, um, in fact, bring us an opportunity. What is happening is that we have leftover spaces between these lines of development, but if we change the coin, if we turn it around, we could say that, you know, or we could use those leftover spaces as part of a park system, bringing uh, the countryside, bringing greenery back into the core of cities. Today we talk about ecosystem services, you know, as the benefits that we derive from nature. So in those years, this wasn't quite the term, but it, it's a very similar idea to try to see how a big city could still be in harmony with nature, could still have enough green space for all its citizens. So there's a democratic vision behind that, that green spaces should be for all and the benefits of accessing uh, fresh uh, air, sunlight, being able to walk from your uh, house in a nice green path all the way out into the countryside again. So there is this very clear preoccupation also with how to reconnect with the countryside. You know, the cities had, in a way, become separate, even more separate from the countryside. I can't now just walk to the countryside um, through a pleasant route as I could potentially before. And this was also part of the argument. So if the growth pattern of the modern city is radio, then um, the argument was that the response should not be a concentric green space planning strategy, but should be a radial green space planning strategy. And in the case of uh, Eberstadt, uh, using the notion of green wedges. And that's how the book started. I um, published this book in 2017. It came out, uh, um, by, it was published by Bloomsbury. Uh, the first part looks into or, or creates uh, a critical history of the idea of uh, green wedges in planning. And it's much more about the search for balance or the search for an equilibrium between uh, urbanity and nature than the model itself, uh, which was essentially the key uh, strategy used to achieve so. And then in the second part of the book, um, I looked at a range of contemporary case studies that try to use the model uh, uh, to promote urban sustainability and resilience in their cities and regions. So I thought I would show you some nice diagrams as well. Uh, here you can see how the concept was, you know, really got spread in the interwar period in many countries. Here we have the kind of the more expressionist views by Bruno Taut, uh, Salman in uh, Australia, Martin Wagner, in Germany, Abercrombie in the UK. So this diagram is by Pepler, he who worked for the Ministry of Health, and Abercrombie uh, redraws uh, his diagram in his book Town and Country Plan in 1933 and uses this idea in the County of London Plan and in the Greater London Plan for post-war London. We see other examples in Germany, um, that's in Brazil, uh, Toronto and perhaps one of the most famous applications of the idea at regional scale, the Copenhagen finger plan. Um, 
the post-war period was quite an interesting moment for this exploration uh, of uh, new ideal visions for uh, a balanced uh, sitting relationship to nature and the country um, because the bombing uh, or allowed well or, or brought um, as close as possible the tabula rasa for many uh, cities uh, in Europe and Abercrombie who did the county of London plan um, really uh, try to think about how um, green wedges could be in collaboration or in, in, in relationship to other forms of green space, such as the green belt, a way to create a network across scales that would um, allow, again, all uh, people uh, in, uh, in London uh, to have access to uh, quality green spaces. And there's a very kind of uh, multi there is a multi-scalar approach that goes from garden to park, park to parkway, Parkway to Green Wedge, Green Wedge to Green Belt. And this has been terribly influential, uh, also in the, in, the, in the Greater London Plan and then elsewhere in the world. You can find numerous uh, solutions today that have this approach of creating a network based on nested scales, you know, uh, going up and down from uh, the private quarters of, um, of the garden all the way to uh, larger features such as the Green Belt and Green Wedges. And I have a, an article dedicated to Abercrombie's plans. Uh, if anyone wants to have a look, um, um, you, can, you can find it here. I don't know if this lecture is being recorded, but if, if they are, if it is, then uh, you would be able to check the, um, the link uh, when you want. So our challenges today then. So we've been seeing how planning with nature has been to a great extent about looking at our challenges and seeing how nature could help us or how our relationship with nature could help us address them. Um, we all know that we are moving towards a much more urban world and a more populated world. Uh, in 2050, we are expected to be 10 billion people. 70% of which will be uh, urban. That takes us to about 7 billion people, more or less the population we have today across the planet, but in cities, in urban areas. We also know that 75% of the CO2 emissions are made by cities. And that the more urbanization uh, we have, the more we tend to affect the uh, ecological vitality of the planet. Now, there was a, a recent report by the IPBS that shows that one million species are facing extinction. That's about 25% of uh, the total. So I um, wrote about this, uh, what I call uh, an apparent paradox of sustainable development, uh, which uh, is the fact that we need to accommodate more people in urbanized areas in a way or another and we need to reduce our impact on the planet and hopefully also address the ecological crisis, address um, um, this problem of um, the diminishing presence of nature um, um, in the planet. So eventually having more green spaces. And that's a paradox because normally the more urbanization we have, uh, the more impact on the planet and the fewer green spaces we tend to have. So how do we address that? And I think this is one of the questions for you, you know, uh, doing your masters, um, being the uh, designers and the planners uh, and the architects of the future uh, uh, to really kind of uh, crack this paradox for us. Um, we all know also that one of the uh, main issues we are facing is global warming. The Paris Agreement um, was uh, attempting to keep our um, uh, to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees, perhaps two degrees. Um, this is not looking very good so far. Um, although COVID has had a positive impact on on the drop in greenhouse gas emissions, um, this is still short, and we now are seeing that with the recovery of economies, um, these may well be uh, supplanted by uh, an even larger uh, emission uh, uh, emission rates, uh, if, if nothing is done. Well, let's see what's happening, what's going to happen in the, in the next COP now. Um, but the situation is not looking very good. There is 
um, a report by the United Nations talking about the progress of the Sustainable Development Goals. And um, it's saying that, in fact, uh, in the last decades, we've seen an increase in the amount of built up area per person. And that amount of built up area per person, in fact, has, has been faster than the, the population growth itself. So we are growing cities faster, in fact, than, um, um, than the population is growing. And here's an example. Um, so this is the region where I live. I live uh, in this black dot here on the north, on the, on the east, uh, sorry, northwest side. So that's Milan. And that's Milan in 1954. And that's the whole region of Lombardy. And then if we look at the same region uh, in 2015, that's how it looks like. No, the, the, the phenomenal expansion of uh, the metropolitan city of Milan towards the north, uh, the pulverization of urbanization across the landscape, and again, also the sprawl of the other important centers in the region of Lombardy. Um, this process of diffusion of urbanization or the diffused cities or what some scholars call the post-metropolis, um, creates a series of questions to us with regards to, again, now the question of climate change, etc., but also in terms of how we conceptualize our relationship with the territory. Uh, the more, uh, how we say, classical standard definitions of the urban and the rural become really challenged. Um, what is urban? What is rural? What is peri-urban? Um, we have, in fact, a range uh, of conceptualizations that uh, make it very difficult to pinpoint um, where urbanity actually is and what urbanity may become. Um, this quote for me is important. Uh, this is by Scott and Len. They wrote that if we are to reconcile the city and nature, a reconceptualization of urban planning is necessary. A reconceptualization of urban planning is necessary. And I believe it is uh, correct, and I think it will go through uh, the reconceptualization of the different polarities of the different domains of the territory, as I was highlighting in the previous slide, but also in how we uh, relate with this very concept of nature and how we are going to eventually uh, reconceptualize or uh, use it much more integrally in our practices. So this is a book um, we it's a work that we've we've done on uh, a range of theories, and strategies, and methods for uh, planning cities with nature. Um, uh, it was a collaboration with um, many scholars from the UK, Brazil, and other countries. Um, this book was edited with a colleague from Manchester called Ian Mel. Um, so you also may uh, may want to consult it. Um, and then it brings us to the countryside. So we talked about the city, we talked about uh, urbanization into the territory at large. And um, the countryside has been the object of a lot of attention from urban scholars, urban planning scholars. Um, OK, let's see why. Um, there's, of course, the question of food. Now, we are likely to lose uh, agricultural land. And I'll touch on that. I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, and yet we still need to produce eventually 70% more food than, um, than we have um, if we are, to, again, to feed all the population uh, that is predicted to come into this planet uh, by 2050. Uh, the European uh, Union uh, launched a Green Deal uh, after now kind of coming out of COVID-19 pandemic, and in that, it says that it will uh, aim to protect 30% of land, 30% of the oceans, and plant 3 billion trees um, to help uh, the continent to uh, address the requirements of the Paris Agreement to try to keep um, our global warming to 1.5 degrees, uh, which is very you know, important, and, and of course it needs to be done, um, but trees take up space and uh, they have to go somewhere. And if we are to plant 3 billion trees, uh, they are very likely to go, most of them, uh, into the countryside. Uh, um, there's this report I'm showing here in blue, so it's a six carbon budget report, the UK's path to net zero. 
and they're saying that if they are to meet, um, if the UK is to meet the um, Paris Agreement and plans or, and, and work uh, heavily on afforestation and reforestation, that would mean a reduction in agricultural land in the region of 21% by 2050. So it, it, it's quite an interesting way to think about what's going to happen with our landscapes, because um, say, let's go back to the 19th century and the planners at that time, they were concerned about urban encroachments onto the countryside. Now we have a nature encroachment, which is no, very good, um, but, it, it, but it, it is another dimension that is appearing very strongly and how the landscapes are going to be more and more hybridized in and around cities. You no, know, the, the, the urban, the rural, the natural and the multifaceted combinations of those, in my view, are going to be more and more uh, present in our landscapes. So this is um, another work that we that we've done. It's a project that uh, lasts last couple of years and it's coming out in early uh, 2022 or eventually in December this year, where we looked at again this question of the polarities of the urban and the rural. From a historical perspective, we looked at a range of examples um, in planning history of how the urban, the rural, and eventually in some cases the natural domains were conceptualized and operationalized um, and how we could eventually take some um, inspiration, some ideas from that to think about our conditions today. And uh, the second main research question was really to do with uh, the question of productive landscapes in uh, urban plans of this period, you know, from the 19th century to the 20th century. And we have a range of case studies from, um, from across the world um, uh, trying to look at, uh, at those questions. And if we come back to the, the, the issue or the question of nature in helping us reconceptualize our relationship uh, with the urban uh, and the natural, um, one of the key, perhaps, uh, keys that will help us unlock that is this idea of systemic thinking or systemic planning. Um, and we'll, we'll go through um, some ideas here uh, for us to, to talk about. Um, luckily, nature is being considered as, uh, as it has been uh, throughout the history of planning as a potential ally in helping us address our challenges. Um, the UNDP said that it can provide 40% of our climate solution. The IPCC report recommended adding a billion hectares of forest to help limit global warming, etc. And there has been a uh, substantial amount of research in the last uh, decades on this idea of ecosystem services. So what are ecosystem services? Um, they are the benefits that we derive from nature. They're normally categorized into these four groups, the cultural, provisioning, regulating, supporting ecosystem services. Um, so provisioning, let's say, of food, raw materials, uh, medicinal resources, fresh water, and you know, the things that we get uh, really directly um, uh, for consumption, the cultural benefits, the aesthetic values of nature, recreation, spiritual uh, and religious values, etc. Regulatory services such as climate regulation, water regulation, air quality regulation, uh, and the supporting ones that support the development of the other uh, ecosystem services. So they are necessary for the other ones to be provided. Um, there's been also much work on aligning ecosystem services with the sustainable development goals and seeing how we can impact, in, in fact, a, um, operationalize those services uh, in cities uh, so that we can uh, uh, address them um, using, uh, using nature. Um, a couple of concepts that I'm sure you are aware of, um, the idea of green infrastructure, uh, very much discussed at the end of the 1990s and, and, and to date, and, and the definition of the, the European Union for green infrastructure is a network. It's a strategically planned network. So uh, a series of green elements, 
combined together. So they are semi natural or semi natural areas which are designed to deliver a range of ecosystem services. So we're talking about a network that's been designed, that's been planned to deliver those benefits. Now, consciously, no? so it's part of the process to think about what those benefits would be and how I actually design my network in order to promote and to deliver those uh, um, uh, benefits. And we have a range of typologies and elements that we can put together in order to create our network. Uh, green blue wedges, green belts, green roofs, green walls, so they range uh, in scale and so on. More recently, the concept of nature-based solutions uh, has come into play. Um, and here we have a very clear focus on addressing challenges. So the definition that the European Union gives is nature-based solutions are actions, actions, interventions that are inspired, supported, or copied from nature that aim to help us address a range of challenges across the spectrum of sustainability of the three pillars, environmental, social, and economic, uh, in sustainable manners. So we are looking here at a focus on challenges that's very, very direct. So we need to think about what challenges we are trying to address with our projects, with our proposals, how ecosystem services could help and what sort of strategies so what are the elements of my green infrastructure? How I can put them together? What are my nature-based solutions that could help us put in place, maximize those ecosystem services that in turn are going to um, help us solve those uh, or address those challenges. Um, and we need to do so um, in a way that is that understands the flows and the exchanges across the various systems and trying to integrate uh, the systems as much as possible, thinking also about the multifunctionality of the landscapes. You can look at this image here on the right, and you could do an exercise and start noting, start writing down all the ecosystem services that you could spot, all the benefits that this landscape could provide or is providing. Mm -hmm. So we could say uh, it's providing um, um, pollination. No? Okay, it's helping with pollination because you know it creates a habitat for uh, insects, for pollinators. Uh, it could be also uh, uh, air quality. We have a range of trees that surely uh, help us with air quality. We have a recreational um, benefit. We have uh, aesthetic values that could be um, you know, appreciated here. We have the question of water management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So multifunctional landscapes with benefits that occur simultaneously, they are more resilient. Those landscapes, because again, if you plan a landscape only with one benefit, only with one service, if that service doesn't quite work out for whatever reason. That's it. No, um, in fact, uh, you uh, economically speaking is not even uh, a very reasonable uh, way to think about landscapes. Now, instead, if you think about uh, the multifunctionality of those, even if I have an issue with a particular service that's not being delivered because of a problem, we still have the others, you know, going on. So the landscapes they tend to be more resilient. They tend to. Um, uh, work uh, in, in, a, in a stronger way. And these types of intervention, they uh, vary across scales. They can go from very localized uh, interventions at uh, building scale uh, all the way to very wide um, uh, interventions as water retention ponds uh, and so on. Um, and there are lots of materials uh, online on that. Uh, we don't have a, a huge amount of time to go through it. Uh, but I'm sure you can find more information online. I will uh, now very briefly show you a couple, uh, and I'm coming 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 close to the end of examples, um, so that you can find. Uh, in this case, in the Green Red Urbanism book, uh, the, the case of Stockholm, um, the metropolitan city of Stockholm, that's trying to resolve that paradox we talked about earlier on of having to accommodate more people in the urban area, um, having to preserve on and enhance its green structure, um, and also 
trying to cut emissions, trying to become uh, more sustainable, more resilient. So you have this idea of being large, dense and green. And Stockholm has, um, since the 1980s, uh, implemented the concept of green wedges. Uh, and, and some of the indicators show how, in fact, this model uh, allow for uh, an increased accessibility compared to eventually other models. 48% in, in, in that case uh, of people have access to, green, to a green wedge within 1,000 meters and 80% uh, within um, uh, uh, 2,500 meters. They have 10 green wedges uh, in the metropolitan uh, city of Stockholm. They have, of course, different characteristics, but they were um, in the last years working very strongly on enhancing the links uh, between the inner areas and the peri-urban areas, and also trying to connect uh, those to um, the more uh, natural areas um, on, on the outskirts of, uh, of Stockholm. This uh, preoccupation with nature occurs at different scales. Uh, here we have a, a very interesting example and, uh, of sustainable development, if we wish, of a district called Hamabi Shostad in the southeast uh, corner uh, of, uh, of Stockholm, where we see the very idea uh, being scaled down uh, to the district level. So we were looking at the more uh, metropolitan scale coming down now to the district scale. Uh, so what we see here on the bottom left is one of the southern green wedges coming into the city. And uh, in the case of Stockholm, they decided to build a, an aqueduct or, uh, or a bridge over a motorway, bringing you know, this green wedge straight into the development uh, and it's a connection uh, not only for people, but also for, um, for wildlife. The case of Freiburg, uh, it's also in, in, in the book. Um, here we have the Drazen Valley uh, at the back, the Black Forest, and we have uh, a very important system of exchanging uh, of uh, um, wind and air temperature that happens between Freiburg and the Black Forest. So this valley draws the fresh, uh, cool air from uh, the Black Forest, which refreshes, which cools down um, Freiburg in the summer um, and takes away you know, the, 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 the warm heat and uh, the more polluted air uh, back into the um, uh, Black Forest. So this area is protected. You cannot build high there in order to preserve these relationships or how that is used as um, um, a regulatory system to minimize um, the urban heat island effect. Freiburg is one of the hottest cities in Germany uh, in, in, in general and in the summer it can get really hot. Uh, another example from Green Wedge Urbanism, this is uh, Helsinki that um, has been working very uh, strongly on developing a metropolitan green infrastructure um, and looking at how one could transform um, previously built motorways, highways that were cutting across the landscape, um, what they were built in the 1960s and 1970s, um, but they were also cutting off people from the green edges because one could not cross those spaces, those infrastructural elements very easily. Uh, so the idea was to think about how they could be transformed into boulevards and open up uh, as such uh, the possibility of using those green spaces and relating uh, them more uh, closely to the urban fabric. Um, so this is uh, another work that, that we've been doing, and it's also coming out at the end of December uh, or the beginning uh, of 2022, uh, which is uh, a book on nature-based solutions for uh, sustainable urban planning. Um, so, so you've seen the cover kind of firsthand, so it just came to us. And I, I thought I would show you this website. Uh, this is, uh, again, leaving a little bit my research to, to one side. This is how we've been relating uh, our research on those topics to our teaching. 
Um, we uh, work with students from the masters in, um, I actually have it here. I believe you are seeing now my, my browser, uh, if not shout. Um, we worked with students from the masters in um, uh, sustainable architecture and landscape design uh, uh, at the campus of Piacenza or Politecnico di Milano uh, onto a range of uh, axes or a range of wedges into uh, Milan. Um, so they developed wider strategies in the first phase of the work and then um, zoom down to particular locations within their access uh, to develop an urban design proposal. So you can all have a look if you wish. Um, so it's a mirror. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not terribly good with mirror. So anyway, but you can see, you would be able to see the boards, um, can put, put comments on the post-it notes. Some of them have videos and um, so, uh, the link is on the presentation if you would like to um, access that. Um, here are some uh, examples on how we've been working with uh, the transformation of landscapes and infrastructure uh, at the peri-urban areas um, and also looking at the question of hybridization of landscapes as I hinted um, earlier on in my, in my talk and how um, agroforestry, um, the exploration of the potentials for hybridization uh, um, can be brought into, um, into our uh, uh, reflections with the students. So to finish off and keep to my 45 minutes, um, so I hoped I showed um, that urban planning uh, has really since its foundation uh, as a discipline or modern town planning, um, that the question of the relationship with nature is at its core. Um, and that relationship has been always modulated by how we uh, think about the challenges that we have. Um, and although there has been a lot of studies into GI ecosystem serves in NBS, um, we need to start reflecting more directly on how we can eventually think about a reconceptualization of our relationship with nature, how we can eventually resolve dichotomies, think um, about multifunctional and hybrid landscapes. And I also believe that mm, a lot of the transformations we will be seeing, uh, of course, will happen in cities, but the peri-urban areas and the agricultural landscape or, or, the, or the countryside is going to be um, where most of the significant transformations are going to take place. Um, and we have a role uh, also to play in that, in, in, in the planning and the design of, of the territory of the landscapes uh, in and around cities as a whole. Thank you very much indeed. And I think I did keep to 45. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much. Uh, uh, it's really, it's really interesting, interesting because, because um, the, main the main idea is, idea is that conversation is happening every day. We cannot stop it. So how to find this balance between reducing the impact, environmental impact and also improving the people's quality of life? How to uh, manage this balance? And uh, as uh, Fabiano very correctly pointed out, one of the solutions could be the answer could be found uh, in nature. So it's really interesting talk. Thank you very much. I'm sure um, we may have many questions. Uh, so I will first uh, put my question. I also have questions. So after that, let's see um, what are the uh, If you have any questions, you can always post them on, on chat and I can uh, direct it to Fabiano. And until that, um, actually, when you were presenting, I was uh, interested to know, like, how is the COVID effect, effects of COVID on the current research field on these um, green wedges? Particularly, it can, as I see, uh, from very um, out of the um, uh, very uh, overlook uh, by the overlook, uh, it can increase uh, improve the air quality. So likewise, how is the effect of the COVID on the current research field on uh, green measures? Thank you very much for, for the question. Um, we are now, I think, all uh, having to reinvent some kind of presets of urban design or, 
or, or come back to some previous ones that we had forgotten, um, to try to address how we can plan for sociability without close contact. Um, so the, the idea of a 15-minute city has come to fore very strongly now. Of course, it's not a new idea. Now it's being recycled uh, from the idea of neighborhood units and so on. And it's uh, now being brought into um, the discussions on urban design and planning. And in that, the question of green spaces appear very strongly. So how can we plan our neighborhoods, our districts, in order that we can get access to the main facilities, to our kind of uh, most direct needs, including green space, uh, in a short walk. No? Again, if we have to uh, go through more quarantines and isolation and so on, um, how do we pulverize this idea in a way that we can um, permit uh, citizens, uh, permit people to do that? Um, we saw that with uh, even with quarantine rules and um, the requests for social isolation, the access to parks, if allowed, they increased uh, during the uh, during the pandemic, we I think there was a uh, a significant uh, reflection on how important those spaces are to us. Now, some of us were locked indoors for weeks uh, without a view to a tree, without a view to a bit of grass, uh, looking at concrete walls, um, and. Um, um, it, 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 we, we could see how, for many people, this was uh, psychologically um, uh, very, very hard. So, cities are uh, thinking uh, a lot about this notion of bringing nature close, um, and also, again, wondering how we can design uh, public spaces that can accommodate both close proximity, but in case we need distancing, how we can do that now again especially considering that we are going to have more people coming to cities and so on so does that mean we have to have green, larger green spaces and if we do um, um, how do we do so so there's there's a lot of work on that on the question of accessibility and uh, and the ways in which we will have to consider also the design of those areas thank you fabiano um are there any questions for uh, Fabiano. Hello. Hi, my name is Vicky. I want to ask uh, something uh, related about urban re rewilding, actually, because I think there is a kind of like controversial uh, question about uh, wildlife uh, in the city. Well, when we're like increasing the green land in the city uh, as well, because human actually they were invading the space that like wildlife where they were living so so at the same time when um, the city is expanding the green space uh, what can we actually see the relation between um, where human lives with the, those green lands and the wildlife in the in in the city um, also um, in the city uh, sometimes we see those uh, closed not close but the space um, like where wildlife wildlife could live but do you think is good idea to increase the accessibility for humans to access them which is maybe could have a negative in fact to bring to the to the wildlife um. that's a, a fantastic question so thank you very much and a very important one uh, we, as planners and designers that uh, work a, a lot uh, in cities, we have a duty to try to help build habitats and help uh, restore habitats, help increase uh, the presence of nature in cities. Of course, we need to be considered uh, when we do that. Now, doing that, say, in the Manchester means one thing. Doing that uh, close to the Amazon, um, let's say, in, in, in a very tropical country where one can get um, uh, eventually a punter coming into your garden um, if you create an ecological corridor is something else. No? So we also need to consider that. So there were some images on the internet the other day of a punter walking around uh, in, in, a, in, in a garden somewhere. 
Uh, yes, but my um, question is not that extreme, like in the real in the forest. Or I know. Something. I understand that. Yes. Yeah, I understand that. I think what what I'm trying to say is that uh, generally we do have to uh, think about how our work can benefit not only humans but also nature. Okay. In that sense, um, when we create our spaces and we think about how uh, our landscapes are going to be in our buildings, uh, we need to consider how we can help biodiversity. Yes, absolutely right. I think we should do that. There are many ways in which we can do that. We can enhance uh, ecological patches, we can create ecological corridors, um, we can work on hybridizing buildings and landscapes, etc. But also we need to be, cons what I was trying to point out as well is that uh, there are these services of nature and we need to be able to acknowledge those so that we are able to overcome any potential problems that could occur uh, out of that. For instance, uh, one uh, could create a green wall, which is beautiful and amazing, but if there is no uh, organization of how this is going to be looked after, uh, who is responsible for the stewardship of that element and so on, uh, what we may end up having is a very dry uh, wall that could become a fire hazard. Okay, So these things need to be considered in context and, um, and we have to think about not only the question of design but also the stewardship of some of those, of those elements and how um, in the long run uh, we are able to uh, bring them uh, almost as an essential part in the way in which we design and so we include them, those nature-based solutions, uh, into every single aspect or, or the various scales uh, of planning. Um, also then the questions of allergies and so on, so there are uh, considerations that we have to take in place um, when we do them and, and the more we take them in, 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 play, in consideration, the better because then we can ensure as much as possible that the spaces are going to be well received and we're going to be working with people to develop those, um, those decisions. So co-participation, co-design is very important. You know, so we understand uh, local needs and, and local preferences and so on uh, in order to develop cities that are both uh, for us, for us human beings, but also for non-human beings. I believe uh, strongly that uh, the more nature, the better is not the case. I believe that some balance needs to be found. I am a believer in urbanity, but also I believe in the power of nature in, in supporting us. Um, I don't want to live in a forest. I want to live in a city and I want to live in a city that has nature, but it still is, is an urban environment, personally. Um, and I think this, again, that's why I've been, uh, in my working career, uh, has been concentrating on, the, on, on this notion of balance. I, I hope it helped.